uh, Gossage uh, Chair. Um, Paul has also directed the Internet Focus Center here at Georgia Tech and is also a past president of the Electrochemical Society. So it's a real pleasure to have you, Paul. Thanks, David. Well, th and thanks for the opportunity to do this. It's uh, always nice to do this, to kind of uh, give a summary of uh, work. And uh, as usual, I know there's a diverse audience here, so I try and do a little of something for everybody. Uh, so first, I want to say um, thanks to the people who have uh, done this. And here are some of the people who I'll show their work. Um, several are here today, including um, Jared, Dami Phillips, Anth uh, Anthony's not here. Um, Jerry Gordon's here, and Paul Joseph's here from, from long ago. And there have been a good number of uh, government and uh, industry sponsors for the uh, summary I'll give here today. So I'm going to give a little bit of uh, history and show some back. Uh, uh, first, I'll show some background to why transient polymers are of interest. And then I'll give um, a little bit of prior results and then a few new things. So um, the whole reason behind this is this business plan for the electronics industry. The electronics industry over time um, has this um, proposition for all of us that they will deliver to us more functionality at the same cost over time or for a given amount of cost more functionality. So they've been doing this now for uh, many decades decreasing the cost per function and uh, we've all enjoyed that through the year over year advancement in electronic devices. Smaller, more powerful. Um, and I'm particularly going to talk about the dielectric materials, the insulators, so I'll show you where they use them and the kinds of things people want. So on integrated circuits, there's some transistors, but most of integrated circuits is a, a printed wiring board. It's the most complicated printed wiring board made. And uh, here you see layers of what's called a dual damascene. Um, copper interconnect. This only has a few layers. They go up to well more than 10 layers of this now. Uh, near the transistors, the wires are very skinny, and as you go up, they become fatter. Um, and uh, the, uh, the copper is made through a copper electroplating, the now famous superfilling. So there's great interest in low dielectric constant materials there. You take a chip and you mount it onto a substrate typically. So there's enormous interest now in better dielectric materials, particularly the stress buffer layer that exists on the back of the chip and of the um, adhesives. They, they are uh, particular mechanical problems they face there. In the package substrate itself, uh, there's a need for higher density of wiring to connect the um, uh, chip to, uh, um, uh, to do some connection within the chip and principally to connect the chip to the next layer, which is traditionally a motherboard or a printed circuit board. And on the printed circuit board, there's um, a great need for higher density and more electrical pathways there. And so um, the dielectric materials I'll talk about touch each of these layers um, so one of the questions is why are better dielectrics needed? And it's a relatively simple answer that in a, a wiring scheme you can imagine a signal going down one wire and there's a return path to going back the other way. For very short wires you can represent it as simply a resistance and capacitance. And there's a simple um, relationship between the rise time in the voltage at the end of the wire with respect to a step change in voltage at the input. So the voltage will rise slowly and it'll get to about 63% of the input voltage at a characteristic time. And that time is called the RC product, which is simply the product of the resistance of the wire times the capacitance. A ohm farad is a second. 
And so when transistors get scaled, that is ever smaller transistors, they operate faster. And so the wires, if they don't also operate faster, they would become the limiting factor in um, the performance of an integrated circuit. So there has been a long-standing need to lower the capacitance and resistance. They've already lowered the resistance as low as you can make it, practically, with copper. Silver's a little bit better, but uh, that's not going to happen. But the lowering the capacitance has been much slower. It's a more difficult problem. For longer wires, you have to include the magnetic effects. So you've got to include the inductance of the a wire and also the conductivity of the insulator. So if you were to take a simple structure like this and uh, look at the output voltage of that, you would find that there's an exponential decay or change in the magnitude of the signal and also the phase change. And it would be attenuated by the resistance, the inductance, the capacitance, and the conductivity. The resistance and inductance are metal properties. The capacitance and conductance are dielectric properties. And you can break part of this down into a contribution from the conductor and part from the dielectric. And this is really the point of this whole slide, that the attenuation or loss will be directly proportional to the frequency. Higher frequency is more loss and directly proportional now to the loss tangent. And the loss tangent is simply the ratio of the out of phase component of the dielectric constant divided by the in phase component. So the loss tangent and frequency um, are going to be um, uh, the important factors. So if we were to rearrange this and take a log of the left hand side, we could plot the attenuation on a log scale versus the frequency, and these are actual printed circuit boards, that there's, they're basically straight lines where the uh, log of that ratio of voltages is directly proportional to frequency. Now it's not, there's all these little glitches in there, and that's because of all the bad things people fabricate on printed circuit boards. They have all these dead ends and sharp turns, and that's what gives you these reflections. But they're generally straight lines. Long, this is a 9-inch long FR4 board. This is a 26-inch long one. Now the problem comes because people want to go to ever higher frequencies. And I'll explain why in just a moment. And this is a map of where the frequencies are going to go to. So now we're in uh, this region primarily. And so soon, people want to go to very high frequencies. And uh, the, the basis behind it is simply the scaling of transistors again. So here's a few pieces of data from the International Technology Roadmap for Semiconductors, which shows you that the size of the transistors is shrinking. So here we are in 2015 with, the, um, with uh, DRAM at 25 nanometers, half pitch and uh, microprocessors, the gate length at 16. So as they get ever smaller, we see that the on-chip frequency will rise. It's going to about double out to the year 2026, from 8 gigahertz to 16. But one of the problems comes in that the number of connections between the chip and the printed wiring board is not going to rise very fast. So every time you do something on chip, you typically have to do something off chip. You either have to get data, store data, or communicate in some way. So the fact that this is doubling and that's not doubling means that you have to have ever higher data rates for the pins you do have. So they project that the package to board speed is going to go up to an astronomical level, 85 gigahertz. And you can't uh, pay your way out of this, so the price of these connections is going to have to drop. So you have to make an ever better connection for less money. 
And you can't just say, well, we want more money so we can build better connections. That's not allowable because if you go back to the first slide with that decreasing business, you know, the price per function getting ever lower, um, this has to happen or that all falls apart. So this is a number to remember, 85 gigahertz or uh, 85 gigabits per second. So if we look back at this chart, uh, so we're not quite at 85 yet, we're only at 10. And the problem is electrically you can only correct for an attenuation of about 30, uh, about 30 dB. And so these boards, uh, and if I just look at this uh, shorter one here, this nine inch one, this have, has a decrease in performance of about 3 dB per gigahertz. That is, we dropped 30 dB and we went up 10 gigahertz. So it's about 3 dB per gigahertz. And you'd like this to become a very shallow one so you can get way out to higher frequencies. So added to this problem is the problem of power. Electronic devices are now power limited. And most of the energy you dissipate in an electronic device just is pushing electrons through wires. So here, this plot, in, um, which is a little while ago, uh, it was 50% of the energy uh, was dissipated in the wires. And it's distributed around with uh, when you distribute the clock and uh, signals, local and global signals. So there's been some evaluation of what is the way you can save power and get the high frequency. So this is a little complicated. I'll kind of walk you through it. These are the different semiconductor technologies, 52 nanometer gate lengths. And, and we can just look at the bottom curve in each of these. So this is the roll off or the slope of that line, 1 dB per gigahertz. And it shows you how much energy it requires to communicate on chip. And it takes a little less, you can do it for one little bit less than a picojoule per bit. But if you try and go out to higher frequencies, this is going to rise. It costs more energy. Now, if you have a poor channel, like 8 dB per gigahertz, uh, not only do you pay more picojoules per bit for communicating, but the optimum number is at a much lower data rate. And if you try to go out to high data rates, uh, there, there's a severe energy penalty. So it's almost an impossible task to make a low energy, high performance interconnect system. There is no known way of doing that. However, air is the best dielectric you can have. So the dielectric is an integral part of this, obviously. That's what's determining that slope. So air is the lowest possible dielectric constant. It's essentially that of vacuum, just uh, just slightly over one, and the loss tangent is um, the lowest possible value. So this is kind of um, how do you make air insulation um, for integrated circuits and packages. So one of the ways we've found is to use these what I'll call vaporizing or transient polymers. Polymers which will depolymerize when stimulated. And this shows you the weight of the polymer versus temperature it was heated to for three different materials. And in this case, the material goes from a solid to a vapor. It lost all its weight because it vaporized at about 200 degrees C. And here's one that goes all the way out to 400 degrees C. And there's whole families of these materials which can efficiently transform from solid to vapor. So you may want different materials because you'll use them in different places. For example, a high temperature material, you may want it because you have to process it on chip where there's going to be annealing of metals and so forth. Whereas something that's going to work with solder will work at maybe 300 degrees. Epoxies don't like to go over 200 degrees. And now there's interest in decomposable packages, things which will disappear on command, either because you don't want it in a landfill or because you cannot retrieve the device and you don't want it to fall into someone else's hands. Uh, and so you want it to disappear on command. 
Um, so I'll, I'll just leave that for the end, uh, disappearing packages. So uh, an additional thing you can do with these materials is um, not only just let them vaporize from free surfaces, but you can make embedded air cavities. And it's a fairly simple process. You just coat a substrate with this material, then form a pattern of it somehow. And one way to pattern it is through uh, the normal micro, um, the microelectronics processing of putting a mask on the surface, patterning that mask with photoresist, doing reactive ion etching, say. But then after you make a pattern of it, you can completely encapsulate this material in another overcoat layer. It can be glassy materials, inorganic glasses. It can be organic materials, different polymers. And when you heat it to this decomposition temperature, the products of the decomposition will permeate slowly through the overcoat, leaving buried air cavities behind. These are pictures from long ago, which maybe Paul Joseph took, or was at least um, here for. And so you can do very thin layers of silicon dioxide. Here are some long tunnels made in that. You can use polymer overcoats, and these uh, products will dissipate through the surface. So the, one of the first activities was to put this into the damascene process, where you most want a low dielectric constant insulator between the wiring lines. So damascene process has a layer of wiring and then a via connection from one layer to the next. So you want the low K material right here. You don't much care about whether it's surrounding the via. You want to surround the line with it because that's where the, the forward and the return path for the wire is. So these, uh, these materials were done by um, a graduate student here in the, in the clean room and they uh, made nice high aspect ratio of the insulator, this thermally decomposing polymer, and, um, and then filled it with copper using the damascene superfilling process and made uh, some nice damascene air cavity structures uh, where this is the copper wire going into the plane of the page and this is the copper and you can see the liner on the copper which keeps the copper from corroding into the polymer. And then this was moved to um, lower temperature processes, off-chip applications. And one of those was for printed circuit boards. So when you make a multi-layered printed circuit board, uh, you take a epoxy fiberglass substrate, an FR4 substrate as they're called, you can make patterns of copper and then we uh, coat that in a special way with this decomposing polymer. And then you can just do the uh, epoxy lamination or a liquid dispensed epoxy, the normal buildup process, layer by layer buildup process of a printed circuit board, and go through multiple layers of metallization. Then when the epoxy is cured, this solid material transforms into a gas, and uh, here's a picture of um, some of those that were made where there's this air cavity between um, a structure going into the plane of the page and the return path, the ground plane above it. And there was a whole, there's been a whole bunch of different um, structures made, some more planar than others, some having more air in them. And so we measured the high frequency performance of these and compared it to um, a typical board that Intel uses for microprocessors. So here is the slope of that line, which we measured. Um, so uh, this is, again, the log of the ratio of the voltages, output over input um, on the y-axis, frequency on the x-axis. And a uh, typical board from Intel is about 2 dB per gigahertz. Uh, the cheaper board that you would find in less expensive parts, maybe 3 or 4 dB. So ours, because of the air cavity, was about 1 dB. So, we, uh, so it, 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 is, it, does, it works the way it should work. Um, so I can tell you a little bit about these polymers now and how the processing went. So uh, po uh, polymer of particular interest are these polycarbonates. 
So this is a carbonate structure, and then you can have different size organic units here. Um, one carbon or two carbon or three carbon or much higher carbon units. And uh, each of them, depending upon what this structure is, will have a slightly different decomposition temperature. And they generally range from 200 to <clears throat> 350 degrees. So um, one of the people here, no, he's not here, sorry. So Dami Phillips uh, did a, a nice project on some of this. So these different materials sometimes decompose at different temperatures, and he figured out a few things about them. So they decompose in two different ways. One of them is to um, have the ends wrap inward, and it makes a cyclic product. So it makes a, um, a cyclic uh, propylene carbonate. And you can either do it from this so-called carbonate end, if, if that's how the polymer is terminated, or this alkoxide end. So there's two different ends on this polymer, depending upon how it terminates or how it was built. And so this wraps up and connects to there, and you get this cyclic propylene carbonate. The other method of decomposition is just a random falling apart or decomposition of the, of the carbonate unit. So there's a end unzipping reaction or a random chain scission. So he found that you can then stabilize each of these mechanisms. So for example, if you put um, a larger organic compound on the end, it cannot undergo this um, unzipping reaction. And so the pure polymer, the decomposition temperature is here at about 200 degrees, the as-received polymer. Then if you suppress the unzipping reaction, you can move it to a higher decomposition temperature by end capping it, as it's called. And if you suppress this mechanism also, you can move the decomposition um, in this case, all the way out to about 270 degrees. So you see there's a fair range of decomposition temperatures that can be achieved by manipulating or um, treating this with uh, different um, end caps or stabilizing agents. It can also be made photosensitive. So one of the ways to do that, our favorite way, is to start with something which is called a photoacid generator. And this comes from photoresist technology, where if you take a compound, a salt, um, and here I show diphenyl iodonium compound, and it usually has some other side groups on it, which is a cation, and then you take the salt, the conjugate base of a strong acid, say triflate or something, the conjugate base of a strong acid. If you irradiate that with ultraviolet light, the um, a, a, a hydrogen ion will be extracted from this molecule somewhere, and you'll make a strong acid. And this is well known, and it's how some chemically amplified photoresists work. So if you do that here, and we were to add this compound to a propylene carbonate polymer, um, the, this acid will attack this weak base. This carbonyl is a a weak base and it'll destabilize this so that you shift the decomposition temperature from about 200 degrees to 100 degrees. So this is the again the weight loss versus temperature and this is the irradiated region where it had this photoacid generator. So this will dry develop. You just take the solid film, expose it to UV light, warm it to 100 degrees and it disappears. So you can directly pattern materials like this. This is a film with holes pattern in it or a serpentine pattern. Or you can now build um, these buried air cavities in a photo process. Spin coat the material. You then irradiate certain portions of the material through a photolithographic mask. Heat it to 100 degrees or so. And when you do that, the irradiated regions disappear. Then you just overcoat it, 
heated to a slightly higher temperature and the polymer that's trapped within the overcoat disappears. So we can do that for these printed circuit boards, but there happens to be even a simpler way to make these air encapsulations around the copper lines. And this was uh, um, some years ago, Todd Spencer, who uh, got his PhD here, discovered this. So if you take a um, silicon wafer with a copper trace on it, coat it with this uh, uh, polycarbonate, polypropylene carbonate, and then put one of these photo acid generators. So now I'm going to call it a thermal acid generator. I'm not going to radiate it with light. I'll just heat it up and at a certain temperature this thermal acid generator falls apart and makes the acid. So if we do that, uh, normally we soft bake the polymer like usual. And what happens is because of the dissolved oxygen in the film, a very small amount of the copper will be oxidized and just traces of copper make it into the polymer. And this blue area is to show you the diffusion front of this copper, this copper, oxidized copper. That happens when you bake it. So if you then heat it to about 180 degrees, what you find is you have perfectly coated this copper line with about a micron or two, depends on how long you heat it and let the copper diffusion, without doing any patterning. It'll self-pattern itself. And the reason is because, so, so this shows you the thermal gravimetric analysis. So this was the polymer with the thermal acid generator. It decomposed at about 180 degrees. But when it's near copper, the decomposition temperature shifts to higher temperatures. And the reason is, um, the reason is, uh, so, so first let me show you some other experiments. So if you use another thermal acid generator without the iodine in it, with a sulfur in it, a sulfonium, not an iodonium, nothing changes. The copper loaded and the non-copper material decompose at exactly the same temperature. Uh, you do find it, so if there's no iodonium, no iodine in it, there is no th um, protection effect. Further, it's not due to the anion. So we tried many different anions and the anion has no effect on this. So what happens is that the copper forms a copper one complex with iodide. And so you form this copper one iodide which destroys this thermal acid generator. So in the regions where the copper was, you don't have this catalyst, this thermal catalyst that happens and it self protects all the copper lines. So that's how those previous printed circuit boards were done. You just coat the surface of the copper, warm it up, and all the copper lines are perfectly protected and the rest of the material just self disappears. So you get a patterning step for free. Another area which has been of interest is um, in packaging. And one of the um, areas with uh, particularly Faruka Yazi um, has been in MEMS packaging. So a MEMS device typically has a movable component, a gyroscope, accelerometer, a resonator. And the problem with packaging them is that you have to protect this, this movable part. And so people have complicated ways of putting lids on them one at a time, brazing or gluing lids on and such. So the activity here was to make, a, to make this MEMS device look like a small integrated circuit so that you could then go to a very inexpensive lead frame packaging, the so-called jelly bean industry for electronics. And the way we do that is simply to put a, um, the sacrificial polymer to protect the movable part, put on an overcoat, and then decompose the sacrificial or transient material, releasing the MEMS device, and then it's perfectly overcoated and you can treat it like a small integrated circuit 
You can epoxy overmold this whole thing and put it on a lead frame or do any, any sort of cheap packaging. So there's different ways. Um, this is uh, kind of a repeat of what I said before. There's different ways to pattern the polymer protecting the MEMS device. We can use the reactive ion etch process, or we can do the direct photo patterning. And the trick to doing this is you have to have, you have to cure this overcoat polymer before the sacrificial ma material decomposes or else it just blows a bubble because you're transforming this from a solid into a gas and it'll have about a thousand times the volume of the, the gas will have a volume about a thousand times that of the solid. So uh, this was um, uh, done here at Georgia Tech again where, um, where the rate of curing of the polymer, in this case Dow's BCB, uh, benzocyclobutene, uh, the rate of curing was compared to the rate of decomposition. And if you do these and you do it quickly or moderately fast, uh, if you do it fast, moderately fast or slow, uh, you can see from, uh, if you look carefully at the rate of curing versus rate of decomposition, that you get the best, um, you get the best condition here, where this has the highest slope for the curing, yet slowest slope for the decomposition. So this process, in about an hour, works fine. You get enough curing before decomposition happens. So you can make nice air cavities around MEMS devices. And these are rather big cavities. They're rather tall and large. So this is a one millimeter marker bar here. So these were uh, rectangles of about two by three millimeters and, and pretty good thickness. So this is when you're looking at it with the BCB overcoat over the top. You're looking through the transparent overcoat at the silicon surface. And so you see this little blemish on the silicon here that when you peel the overcoat off, you can see the blemish still sitting on the silicon. So the silicon is quite clean. There, there's an ever so tiny residue left behind from the decomposing polymer. Um, and you can see some characteristics of the BCB. It has a slight wrinkle in it here, which is of, of no real consequence, but you can see some features in it. And so that brings us to now a even lower temperature, to this area where now people would like uh, transient materials. And again, the reason why is you either don't want them to last forever, you don't want to fill landfills with it, but uh, the sponsor is more interested in the, uh, it is not convenient to go and retrieve the device. You don't want someone to find it or to know that a device even existed. So to do this, um, we, we have used these so-called low ceiling temperature polymers. So the ceiling temperature is the property of a polymer, so if we have um, monomers here, so we have n number of monomers reacting with one more monomer, we make a polymer out of it with n plus one units in that polymer. So the ceiling temperature is that temperature where below the ceiling temperature it's in the polymer state and above the ceiling temperature it's in the monomer state. And most of the materials you use have very high ceiling temperatures because you don't want them to fall apart when, when you're using them. But there are many polymers with so-called low ceiling temperatures. For example, here's some aldehydes, formaldehyde and acetylaldehyde. Uh, so the ceiling temperature here is minus 39 degrees C. And uh, here's one we like, this thalaldehyde has a ceiling temperature of minus 42 degrees C. And uh, the boiling point um, of this thalaldehyde, so it liquefies at room, it's a liquid at room temperature and uh, boils at 200 some degrees. But others have lower boiling points and we certainly would like something like this which would easily boil. So these materials are ones you have to synthesize at low temperature when you're below the ceiling temperature. So they're typically made at my, maybe minus 60 degrees or minus 80 degrees. And then what you do so they don't fall apart is you do 
the same thing I showed you before with the polypropylene carbonate. You simply trick it into not decomposing by stabilizing the ends of it, or so-called end capping of the polymer, which just traps it in the polymer state. So at room temperature, this material is stable, it's a solid, but thermodynamically it wants to, be, uh, wants to go back to the monomer state, become a liquid or a gas. So there's two ways to do this. Um, so this is one that works particularly well, thalaldehyde. It has these two carbonyl groups. So you start this off by uh, taking this, um, you take a strong base and you create an anion from this hydroxyl group. And then it will uh, transfer that anion from monomer to monomer until you make this polymer chain where this unit here, the thalaldehyde, is repeated many times. Then when you put enough monomers together, you cap it with something. So this was attractive because you can then build particular functionality in the end caps. You can maybe make it photosensitive or something. So this synthesis wasn't quite as easy as um, it looks here. So, um, but nevertheless, it um, does form a stable solid. This is the thermal gravimetric analysis. It decomposes at 100 something degrees, even though its ceiling temperature is below zero. Then if you were to take the ends off or trigger this, it, it would immediately fall apart. It'll immediately depolymerize. So a better, turns out a better way to do this is the so-called cationic route, where you take um, a BF3, say, uh, which can make a cation out of one side. Now this makes an interesting product because it's a cyclic product. So here we have many, many of these repeat units by, given by this number N, and this can hit tens or hundreds of repeat units. Um, so uh, an advantage of this is there are no ends, so we don't have to ever worry about that unzipping reaction from the end in because there are no ends. And uh, Jared Schwartz, who's here, he's gone through um, a lot of synthesis. Each, each point here is a, a different synthesis try. And what he's been able to do over time is to get to very high yield and very high molecular weight. And these are hundreds of thousands. So this is 100,000 molecular weight here and uh, relatively uh, high yield, 90% or more. And these are generally the materials you like to make structural things out of. One of the problems with this thalaldehyde, though, here at the bottom, is that the vapor pressure is relatively low. So it would be nice to have things with higher vapor pressure. And as you go up the list here, these materials have, um, are smaller, so they have higher vapor pressures. And some of them are shown here. Here's uh, thalaldehyde. Uh, so its vapor pressure at 20 degrees is small, but if you have some of these other materials, they have more substantial vapor pressures. In addition to that, they, um, in addition to simply evaporating more quickly, some of them depolymerize more quickly. So the polymers and quite as stable. So he's made a number of these copolymers. Um, uh, he's made a number of these copolymers and tries to take particularly this one, uh, this um, butyraldehyde, and, um, which has a higher vapor pressure and makes the material a little less stable, so it's higher sensitivity and decomposes faster. And then these can be made into different things. This is uh, Jerry Gordon sitting here, made this chart, how you can use these polymers to make, a, say, a printed circuit board, a disappearing or transient printed circuit board, where you will use um, inks made with the vaporizing polymer. There can perhaps be adhesives made from transient materials. So he's come a long way now in making these um, printed circuit boards out of vaporizing materials, which is supposed to go into a, a product from a company, a demonstration product from a company for transient sensors. So uh, here is the um, a picture in a microscope 
and, and this will run on a loop. Um, so this is the thalaldehyde, the homopolymer. Um, it was photoactivated, so there's a little photoacid generator put in there at the beginning of this clip. It'll, it'll run again in just a second. So as soon as it was irradiated with light, it starts to liquefy, and this is speeded up 15 times real time. Uh, this is the copolymer with butyraldehyde and thalaldehyde. This is speeded up five times, and this is more desirable because you don't see quite as much liquefaction. As this decomposes here, you can first see the signs of it just evaporating away. So it goes less through a liquid state, and after some short amount of time, it'll just be totally gone. Uh, so the photoactivation is important for this. They like to, uh, some people want to photo trigger these materials. Here's a typical contrast curve that you would do for photoresist. This is the thickness of the photoresist remaining after you have exposed it and um, done the developing. And then uh, as a function of the dose of light, so you hit the uh, critical dose, in, in this case about 10 mill, a little less than 10 millijoules per square centimeter, which is an extremely small amount of light, UV radiation. Um, and then uh, by um, 11 millijoules for this developing time, the, the material is completely gone. So this is a typical contrast curve as one would do for photoresist, but here it is, of course, being dry developed. So what we do is we do this at UV light, but people, uh, 248 or 365 nanometer exposure, uh, but this doesn't quite work for uh, things out in, um, uh, out in uh, you know, just sunlight because there's very little 365 nanometer and virtually no 248 nanometer light out there. So what's been done is to make this sensitive, the visible light. And um, so sensitizers can be made from fused aromatic rings. Here's anthracene, tetracene, pentacene. And as you fuse more rings together, the absorption region goes further into the red. So anthracene absorbs um, just into the violet, uh, 400 nanometer, but as you go to tetracene, you get into orange and yellows, and then finally pentacene is absorbs in the red. So nice, it goes to longer wavelength, but the solubility is a problem for things like this. So what um, Anthony, and, uh, Anthony Engler and Dami Phillips have done is they've synthesized based upon anthracene, tetracene, and pentacene, um, they have put these side groups on it, which make it um, soluble in the solvents we use and more sensitive. So I'll compare uh, this one, and the A stands for anthracene as the backbone, this one tetracene, and the P here is for pentacene. And you can see the colors of them here. This one now is yellow, and this one red-orange and this one um, uh, 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 very deeply colored. So the problem with sensitizers is not only do you have to absorb the light, but it has to transfer the energy to the photocatalyst. So this is a simple idea. So if this is the sensitizer, uh, this is the um, lowest filled molecular orbital, and this is, I'm sorry, the highest occupied molecular orbital, and this is the lowest unfilled molecular orbital. So this is like the band gap of the sensitizer. So this level has to be higher than the um, lowest unfilled orbital of the photoactive compound in order for energy or an electron to be transferred. So we can measure each of these levels independently. You just can do three measurements and some of these you do electrochemically, and uh, Dami has done that. So here is the highest, um, the lowest unoccupied orbital for the photoactive compound. And then over here, these three are the highest levels for the um, anthracene, tetracene, and pentacene compounds. So you see that the pentacene is, would not be very effective at transferring energy from here to here because it's not higher than there to there. 
So um, it turns out that the overall effectiveness is not the longest wavelength or most absorbing material, but it's the one with the greatest ability to transfer energy. So we did this and translated into the depolymerization time um, in, in sunlight, and this is in Atlanta here. So it takes about eight seconds to fully expose and get these anthracene-laced thalaldehydes um, to depolymerize. Um, one of the difficulties is what do you do with these materials since they're photosensitive? How can you work with them? Well, that's a simple idea that you would make a device and you only need a small amount of this photocatalyst and it can be added at the last moment after the package is completed. So and the idea is that you load this red layer with the photoactive compound and that catalytic proton will diffuse into the unloaded material. So you can just add this at the last moment. And uh, if you look at the diffusion front, uh, the diffusion coefficient is roughly the length squared over time, or oh, I'm sorry, over distance. And so uh, time, my length squared over time. So if you plot length squared for that diffusion front versus time, you do get a straight line and the diffusivity is about 0.1 square micrometers per second. A second idea was to add another compound which actually amplifies the acid. So there are compounds that once you activate them with an acid, they will give off the original acid and then create a new acid. So one acid then becomes two, those two become four. And so the idea would be that we would load the material with this amplifier so that even just a trace of an acid made in this little pinch of material on the top then becomes amplified and quickly goes through the material. And here's a um, demonstration of that. Here is the uh, thalaldehyde polymer on the left with nothing added. Here it is on the right and we're, we're warming this little heater here and it shows that the acid amplifier decomposed, made an acid, and um, decomposes the amplified material where the unamplified material just sits there and is, is just fine. And this is in, in real time. So again, it takes half a minute or so for this to vaporize. And you can see this in uh, a contrast curve. This is the contrast curve with no acid amplifier. And so it took for uh, this um, thalaldehyde, it took a, seven, a dose of about 700 millijoules per square centimeter. But when you add the amplifier in, you cut that in half. And this is happening at room temperature. And lastly, there are even our materials which are kind of gooey in nature, which we're trying to make into vaporizing adhesives. So you can put parts together, they'll act like scotch tape. And then when you hit a critical temperature, they'll, they'll disappear. So with that, um, I'll just make a, a few um, comments that for the um, electronics industry that this, uh, this loss tangent, the dielectric constant, but in particular the loss tangent is a critical value which has to be decreased and any economical way to do that is of great interest. Uh, electronics are going to continue to be denser less materials, shorter path length, uh, lower stress at all these structures because as you remove materials, you remove those buffers between dissimilar materials and the coefficient of thermal expansion penalty is minimized if you can add these low stress or deformable materials. And lastly, this is a kind of a new area, these transient devices either no detection of them, you'll never know they were there if someone had one in your room when they wanted to disappear, or you don't have this collection and um, disposal of them problem. And with that, um, thanks for your attention and be happy to answer any questions.
Oh, well, oh so, um, so the first question is, how do you, um, how do you measure the curing reaction? Right. Yeah. So, so, so BCB is is kind of a they, they sell it to you as a actually a trimer. And so it undergoes a deals alder reaction. And so you can analyze it for a particular chemical unit. You can do spectroscopy on it, that when that unit disappears, it has reacted. So it's, a, it's an easily done thing. And people have now made these master charts for BCB, time at temperature and degree of cure all on one plot. So, so you don't even have to do it. You can just go to these master charts and see time at temperature and get a degree of cure. And then the second part was the... Um, oh, the BCB. So BCB you can either get in non-photosensitive material, which you coat it and react it, cure it. Uh, if you want to pattern it, you use dry patterning methods, reactive ion etching. Or you can uh, get a photosensitive version of it. And so you'll, um, uh, you'll, you'll just do an exposure like photoresist and print it. You'll develop it and then cure it afterwards, which is, which is the easier way to do it. And that, that's what was done here, the photosensitive BCB. Um, well, uh, so the politically correct answer would be, sure, there's always hope for it, but, but the realistic answer is there's, I don't see any way out of the epoxy, the bisphenol A epoxy world we're in. Bisphenol A, uh, diglycetyl ether, that epoxy you build um, airplanes out of, boats, um, um, electronic printed circuit boards is one of the least expensive, easily made polymers there are. Very functional, versatile, and the infrastructure for it is so enormous, I don't believe anything is going to replace it in our lifetime. It is just so easy to use it. Its adhesion is super. You know, you can buy it in, this is glue from the hardware store. Um, it's, uh, the toxicity is minimal. We're in an epoxy-based world. And the only reason you have the electronics you do is because of epoxy. So much of it is this epoxy-based. And so I don't think there's any way out of that, particularly with the cost uh, that it would, you, you know, other things are just going to be more expensive. You get epoxy at such low cost. So I think we're in an epoxy world for, for our lifetimes. Yeah. Um, on command, um, I, I imagine something like a, a science fiction movie where this message will, <laughs> will, yeah. will self-destruct in, in a few minutes. Um, is, is that the sort of thing that we're yeah. talking about? That, and what would be the byproducts of that? Or is it well, so, so the applications are that people would like to decompose them on command, either through an electrical signal, you know, you hit a button there, and if you had some small sensors in this room, they would begin to vaporize. They will disappear on your electrical signal command. And you can imagine how we could do that with a tiny photodiode inside a package. It would light up and start these photochemical reactions, and this just happens at room temperature. Or if you were to pick it up and you were to open it and it got room light in there, these are sensitive to the visible light, that's why the visible light interests you, pick it up and somehow you expose it, um, it disappears in your hands. So the major use of this are people who want to um, interrogate different regions and don't want anybody to know it. <laughs> So you, 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 you can imagine who these kind of people are. Um, yeah, right. Right, and, and, and so they'll, you know, they, these are going to be more expensive. They're kind of specialty materials and small volume. So at small volume, you're just going to pay more money. Um, 
but, but those are kind of the first uses of this. Someone who wants to have their product not found by anybody. And the residue for this, so from the polymer there's virtually nothing. Uh, some of the inorganic materials, it's hard to get them to disappear. You know, the, even if you made a little bit of salt, say, they hope that the salt will be so fragmented you can't see it. So if it's less than 10 microns or so, you, you typically can't see it, and so it would be effectively vanished. Although they would like to make everything go to the vapor state, obviously. Um, and, and they do not want it um, to be high temperature, because then you may um, see a residue, a thermal signature from it. Either it burns the thing below it, or, or you feel it. They'd like this all to be at room temperature. Um, under a minute would be fine. So that's kind of the application. But, but I think for there are some commercial uses of something like this, a product which is only meant to be used a few days. You know, maybe there's little sensors or something you would use somewhere. And when you're done, you would just crack them a little bit, and then you would throw it somewhere, and, it, and it'll just disappear. You know, it won't wind up in a landfill. One more, if I may. Um, specifically, you said you were talking about how you could make quite a large air gap yeah. over, uh, over an electrical circuit. But um, is that, could that be somehow controlled using different layers? I'm specifically thinking about, uh, for example, um, high-capacity capacitors. So, so possibly there won't be a problem in making. So, if you're thinking the distance between two plates, say, getting that as thin as so, we can make these just as, you know, just as thin as you would like. They've been made as you know, ten nanometers or so, and below that, it's hard to measure how thin it is. But, but, but you can make very, very thin films. Um, so, so you can make very thin layers. Um, one of the issues, though, is these superstructure around it. Does it remain perfectly rigid, or does it deform a little bit, and would it close off in certain regions? So, stiction problems can be, um, you know, a detail you have to work out. But we made structures just as small as 10 nanometers or so. Um, they certainly can be layered. You know, you can deposit a layer of this, deposit a polymer, layer polymer, or metals in there are fine. You can make as many layers as you want. So this, this is an okay idea. Um, so, so certainly some details to work out whenever you have such thin layers like that to get everything working together, I think would be the hardest part of that. Mm -hmm. Let's thank Professor Cole yeah. one more time. Thanks, David.